2018 edition of our, quote, weekly top three, close quote, podcast. In this 15 minutes each week, uh, we attempt to capture the three issues that we think are most important uh, looking forward as we make the turn from the past week uh, to the week upcoming. This upcoming week, uh, the Alaska Legislature will start the second session of its 2017-2018 term. By all accounts, uh, by all measures, uh, fiscal policy is going to play a central role, if not the dominant role, uh, in, the, in the legislature uh, this coming week, and we will want to stay on top of it through these podcasts. This week, we're going to focus on three issues. First, the Legislative Finance Division's analysis of the governor's uh, proposed 2019 budget. Uh, there's some things in there that we think are surprises we want to talk about. Second, an article uh, that appeared in Politico magazine, a national magazine this week about the Alaska legislature, talking about the Alaska legislature turning more progressive. Frankly, we don't think that's the case from, uh, from a fiscal policy standpoint. Um, and third, uh, we want to talk about oil prices, uh, something that, that is critical to uh, Alaska uh, budget and policy making, fiscal policy making, um, something that's in flux as we, as we record this uh, podcast today. Oil prices have, Brent oil prices have touched $70. Again, a uh, substantial change from what they've been forecast before. First, let's talk about the Legislative Finance Division analysis of the governor's proposed budget. The Legislative Finance uh, Division's analysis was published last week. You have to dig down a little bit to find it. It's on the Ledge uh, uh, Finance website, and then you go to public tab that says Publications, and then you go to Yearly Publications, and then you go to Governor's Overview, uh, and you can find the analysis. It's an interesting analysis. Um, there's a there's a, been a debate that legis Legislative Finance is has stepped up to that, that talks about whether, le the, whether the analyses, whether budgets coming out of the Alaska legislature are accurately reporting um, uh, spending levels. The, the analysis uh, starts out uh, under the heading FY19 budget by saying this, quote, despite past efforts to improve budget presentation, including producing reports at various levels of detail and splitting appropriations into four categories of funds, there are people who denounce budget reports as fake news designed to make budgets appear smaller than they really are. And then the next sentence is, is, is the surprise. It says, there is a grain of truth in their concern that budgets are distorted. It is fair to say that budget comparisons between fiscal years are rarely undistorted. Close quote. So admitting that at the outset, uh, Ledge Finance tries to do what they say is a better job uh, of putting together the analysis and being truer in terms of representing the actual cost than, than perhaps past, uh, past efforts uh, have been. And in doing so, they, they highlight some significant uh, differences between the way they look at the governor's proposed budget and the way that uh, the governor himself tried to sell the budget. The governor tried to sell the budget as, as representing a reduction um, in spending, uh, in fact, a substantial reduction of over 180, 80 some odd million dollars. But Ledge Finance says the governor, this is, this is them talking about the governor's budget, the governor released a quote transparent close quote budget that shows a reduction of $150 million from FY18 budget levels. Does this mean the governor found a way to fill the holes and reduce spending by an additional $150 million? Not exactly. The governor's budget misses the mark on transparency. Proposed UGF spending in FY19 exceeds UGF spending in FY18. So uh, in the course of calling that out, in the course of trying to uh, uh, represent true budget numbers, uh, legislative finance says the governor is significantly understating the amount of spending that he proposes. And when you go to the fiscal summary that Ledge Finance prepared that, that pr compares the two, and you can find that, again, by going to publications on the Legislative Finance website uh, and then going to Fiscal Summary, clicking on Fiscal Summary and then clicking on uh, 2019. There are substantial differences between what the governor says the, his budget is and what Ledge Finance uh, uh, finds to be uh, proposed spending. 
comparing uh, the FY19 governor's proposal to FY18, uh, uh, ledge finance says FY18 spending levels are about $4.3 billion. This is unrestricted uh, general fund before uh, dividends, before distorting it by including or excluding dividends. 4.3 traditional uh, analysis. Uh, and that's that's generally what both the governor and the legislature said they came up with last year. The proposed spending that the gov that the legislative finance division says the governor is proposing in the coming session is 4.58 uh, billion dollars, um, another 230 million dollars more than FY 2018 spending levels. That's compared with the governor's claim that spending uh, FY 19 spending his proposed FY 19 spending level is less. Even that number though, the 4.58 billion, uh, is understated because it doesn't include uh, the repayment of oil and gas tax credits uh, in, in the calculation of that number. Those are left out entirely. Uh, the governor's uh, proposed estimate or the Department of Revenue's proposed estimate of those for FY19 is another $200 million. So that brings spending to four point uh, seven, roughly $4.8 billion proposed FY19 spending. And then Ledge Finance goes through and finds that uh, retirement savings are understated, or retirement spending is under, uh, understated as well, which adds another $25 million. So roughly at the end of the day, uh, the, the proposed budget uh, that the governor has submitted after you go through the Ledge Finance analysis is about $450 million higher than uh, FY uh, uh, 18 uh, proposed spending levels. Significant differences, something we're going to be digging in throughout this session, but anybody who's, who's interested in fiscal policy during this coming session should read the, the ledge finance summary uh, and, and get a sense of their analysis of what the governor's proposal has been. The second thing uh, that we're digging into, they'll be digging into this, this coming week, is, was triggered by an article in Politico magazine uh, about Alaska state representatives entitled, quote, how to turn a state purple, uh, Democrats not required. The purple is obviously a reference to uh, the color scheme that we now use to talk about uh, politics in America, red being Republican, uh, blue being Democrat, and purple being the transition from one to the other. In the context of this article, it's really talking about uh, the, the, the prospect that Alaska is turning purple, going from red to purple, based upon the election of certain uh, uh, new state representatives, one of them being Jonathan Caprice Tompkins of uh, Sitka, another being Jason Gren um, of Anchorage, and in fact, uh, Representative Gren's picture is featured as the cover uh, photo for uh, this piece uh, in uh, Politico as an example of someone who's working to turn Alaska red into purple. The irony and the reason we're digging into that, we'll be digging into this in the coming week, is that for all of their efforts and for all of their rhetoric, they really aren't coming up with a better result from a fiscal policy standpoint uh, in terms of impact on Alaskans uh, than, than the conservative uh, Republicans are. You've heard us talk about before the ICER analysis, the Institute of Social and Economic Research analysis, that finds cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and, and is by far the worst, the most costliest from the standpoint of Alaska families of all of the uh, various new revenue options. Well, the irony is the House uh, uh, influenced by this move to purple is doing as much damage <laughs> to the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families as, as the Senate is. While the House has a component of, uh, uses a progressive inca in income tax for a component of its revenue, that's really to generate revenue on top of what the Senate is generating through its PFD cut. The base of the House proposal, just like the Senate's, is a significant PFD cut. So these progressives that the article is trying to focus on, saying that they're moving Alaska progressive, are in fact voting for the same, the very same sort of thing, very sor same sort of fiscal options 
that are adversely impact middle adversely impacting middle and lower income Alaskans as the Senate is. They're voting for the very same type of PFD cuts that have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. By far are the costliest for Alaska families um, of all of the options. We talked about this issue uh, last uh, fall in a piece on our blog with the title, quote, why are Alaska Democrats and independents sticking it to middle and lower income Alaskans and close quote, and to, and to show that analysis, we did an analysis of the impact of the House proposal uh, by broken down by income bracket uh, in the same fashion that the Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy had done for the House uh, earlier in the session. And that analysis showed that for a family of four, the House proposal uh, dealt, gave more benefits to the upper income than they did to middle and lower income Alaskans. For example, uh, under the House proposal, the upper income uh, would, would pay essentially 4.5% in reduced income uh, uh, under the House proposal. The middle uh, income bracket, the middle 20%, would pay 7.8%, uh, uh, close to double uh, what, the, uh, lo uh, what the upper income bracket was. And by the time you got to the lowest income bracket, uh, even under the House proposal, uh, a family of four was paying 24%, nearly 25% of their income um, uh, back to government uh, uh, as a result of the House proposal. So it is as regressive, the House proposal uh, had has components that make it um, regressive in the same way uh, as the Senate's proposal. Not, not, a, not a very progressive, purplish uh, proposal at all. Um, as one acquaintance put it at, at one point as we were having discuss, discussion about this, while the D's should be advocating for the working poor in the cash economy, instead they're pimping, like the Republicans in the Senate, they're pimping for bureaucrats earning $140,000 a year, making the impact of the fiscal policy lower on them than, than on uh, working class Alaskans in the middle and uh, lower income bracket. So we'll be digging more into that issue uh, in the coming week. Finally, the third issue we want to touch on are oil prices. As we, as we went to press on this blog, as I said earlier, uh, oil prices were above uh, $70 a barrel Brent oil prices, which is similar to how Alaska trades were above, was above $70 a barrel. That is a significant increase uh, over the estimated prices uh, that uh, the Department of Revenue has been basing their analyses on, and because that's what Department of Revenue does, that's what the Alaska Legislature has been basing their analyses on. For example, uh, looking at 2018, current year, for current fiscal year we're in, uh, in the spring forecast, Department of Revenue estimated or projected uh, oil prices at $54 a barrel, in the fall forecast, they, they upped it to $56 a barrel, but still substantially below the current $70 level uh, that we're experiencing right now. Uh, under In the spring forecast, the Department of Revenue didn't get to $70 until uh, some, somewhere around 2022. In the fall forecast, the, uh, the Department of Revenue actually lowered uh, future years and didn't get to $70 a barrel until around 2026, uh, yet those are the price levels that we're experiencing uh, currently in the fiscal year 2018. Now, that's not to say that we're going to stick at $70 a barrel or even that, that, that we're materially going to go up from that, uh, but the fall off that the futures market is predicting isn't much. If you look uh, out to the futures strip for the remainder of 18, they're still at $69 a barrel. Uh, they're still above $65 a barrel uh, by December 18th. Again, this is against a projection uh, that the administration has of $56 a barrel. So we're, we're clearly $10. I mean, the futures market is telling us that we're clearly going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 above uh, the, the forecast level. And then when you go on out, there's drops uh, to some degree in the futures market. Uh, but they're not coming back to the levels uh, that the administration forecasts. So 
we're dealing with a different price deck, a price deck going forward. Interestingly, the price deck we're looking at is similar to what the EIA, EIA Energy Information Administration, forecast last January, and that we had done some analyses on Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets had used in some analyses um, earlier in the year uh, to say that the type of new revenue levels that the, that the legislature was coming up with, we didn't need those, that we could survive if we just used Hammond 50-50 uh, plus, uh, plus a reasonable oil price projection. So the future is at least current price levels are trending more toward the price levels we've used in our past analyses uh, than they are anything the administration or the legislature has been using um, in theirs. That means going forward or as we go into this coming week and as we go into this coming session, uh, we need to be looking carefully, we Alaskans, the legislature, uh, certainly we at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, need to be looking carefully at the oil price levels that the legislature and the administration are using to pin uh, fiscal policy on going forward. Things right now don't look as dire uh, as the administration was forecasting in terms of oil prices. They certainly don't look as dire as the administration was, was forecasting in terms of production levels. Production levels times price, higher production levels times higher price, mean higher revenue levels. Uh, so we think that, that, that the picture is changing as we come into this legislative session. The picture underpinning fiscal policy is changing, uh, and we want to stay on top of that and will be one of the three issues that we're looking at not only this week, but we suspect in, in weeks beyond. Well, that's going to do it for this week's weekly top three. We hope you join us next week and every Monday as we discuss the top three issues we see.